Fill her up, son. Don't be staring. Yes, that's a real diamond she be wearing. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. This is Big Anklevich. This is Rochelle Field. And this is That Gets My Goat. An evergreen episode. Who knows when you'll hear it, but you will be hearing it. Never. Never. It will be like the That Gets My Goat behind the curtain. Yeah. Where we told you about our thoughts and feelings and what what we thought the future of the show would be and no one ever ever heard it yeah well that was what we call a non evergreen one <laughs> what is the opposite of evergreen uh, already des- dead deciduous <laughs> hey that's not bad it dropped its leaves dead on the vine and unfortunately you can't put the leaves back on so that one yes died and was never heard maybe it'll be a incentive episode or something someday well see you and i could do uh a Hobbit episode or a Amazing Spider-Man episodes now that you've seen them and those I guess are technically evergreen since the movies aren't new anymore true and then movies don't go away right so. but we usually try and get them out as soon after they've come out I guess because they're topical I don't know why do we do that just I guess that's what people do you review talk about a movie you do it right when the movie comes out yeah and then people can see your review or Decide to go see the movie because of your review or listen to it right after seeing the movie and decide whether they agree with the crap you said or I don't know. But anyways, yeah, today we're just going to talk about something that's not timely. It's kind of an unusual thing, really. Um, Rish and I met back when we were in college. Um, and when we met, we apparently had this in common already. But we're completely unaware of it. We became friends because of being film school guys together and working on films together and stuff like that. And by chance, it turns out we're also both really big fans of Sting. I remember the first time I ever talked to you about Sting being in the fine arts building on campus. And talking about how Sting was... So, one of the coolest things about Sting was how his B-sides were even better than the, the actual album tracks. At the time, we were referring to the uh, the single that had come out. I think it was... I'm not... I'm so happy I can't... What was it? Uh, you Still Touch Me was the single. And it had like three absolutely awesome B-sides all on the one single... <laughs> Where it could basically could have been an EP on its own of just awesome stuff. Now, did you love You Still Touch Me? Because no. I felt like the B-sides were all better than You yeah, Still Touch Me. Yeah, You Still Touch Me is not... Uh, all three of those B-sides were better than You Still Touch Me. Although I remember... It was I, a good song. I yeah. think the... F- bef- it was probably before I even knew that you were interesting. In our screenwriting class, you used You Still Touch Me at the start of your... Uh, your screenplay, you had your main character driving up into the woods to hang himself or something like that. And then Zorbaz, what was the name of the alien? <laughs> Z-Boss. Z-Boss, the alien comes down or something and stops him from hanging himself. But as he's driving up into the woods, he hears, Another night finds me alone. And that's what you used as like your intro. And only you picked up on that. I, I'm probably the only one that remembered it because I was already a big fan of Sting and of uh, that stuff and that album. So, you know, when that's what it says, I knew exactly what song you were talking about. And it wasn't one of the singles that you heard on the radio. I guess it was a single, but I never heard that song on the radio. Um, it wasn't like, I'm so happy I can't stop crying. Or... They put that on the radio? See, I don't remember. I I've heard the Toby Keith song a bunch. Yeah. I mean, that that version a bunch of times, but it seems like it'd be too country for whatever alternative station we'd be listening to that, you know, still playing Green Day songs. <laughs> That's true. But... I don't remember which one. I guess uh, Let Your Soul Be Your Pilot I heard on the radio, but I don't know. That song's long. It's, it's almost seven minutes long. I'd be surprised that if they played it on the radio too, yeah. all that often. <laughs> But that was his uh, single, his lead single or whatever from that album. Anyways, yeah, we both are big fans of Sting independently. And uh, the strange thing is both of us are like huge, huge enough fans that 
we sought out all the singles, all his B-sides, every last little crumb that fell from his lips. You know, we're there to catch it. But that had nothing to do with how we became friends or any basis of our friendship, really. So you didn't approach me afterward and say, hey, that was a Sting song. That was You Still Touch Me. I, I, we weren't... I don't remember us being friends at that time. Yeah, we were still starting to get to know each other at that time. So it was... Yeah, just that we were... Semi, I think, you know, we knew each other. We were friendly. But yeah, we didn't become really good friends until much later. So... I didn't, I don't think I approached you about it. I do remember at one point talking about staying with you for five minutes or less. Well, you had places to go and people to do. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> but yeah, um, I figured it'd be interesting to talk about that, to talk about where that came from. So to start with, what? when do you remember first starting to be a fan of Sting where were you first introduced to him and etc well see I'm not old enough to have been listening to music during most of the police era mm -hmm. I think Synchronicity is the only album that was out when I was listening to music right and my uncle had a copy of Synchronicity which was the last police album and and, and anyway, anyway, I borrowed it and I was listening to it and I looked at the cassette and it had a song called Murder by Numbers on it. And what I was listening to was Tea in the Sahara. But I thought that that song was Murder by Numbers. And so because I didn't have the album or whatever, I went home and, and, and thought, you know, my, this song is so cool and it's called Murder by Numbers. And yeah, it wasn't until like years later that I was like, that's not Murder by, Murder by Numbers is totally different. That's Tea in the Sahara. But that also had Every Breath You Take on it, which I loved from, you know, childhood on. And I believe... Everyone else in the whole world did as well. No, I'm trying yes, to think of the other did. song on there that got tons of radio play. Uh, I would say Synchronicity 2 had tons of radio not play. Here. Oh, it didn't? I didn't ever hear that until You didn't get... Yeah! No, sorry. It, I may, I'm going to say it might radio. have been King of Pain. I don't King know. of Pain did get a it lot of radio It wasn't a single, though, too. King of Pain wasn't. But it, maybe it got a ton of radio play. I don't know. It, it seems like there was one other... Because that was their big album, you know, that had hit after hit. It just seemed like there was another one besides Every Breath You Take. But, yeah. But anyhow, uh, I, th I thought that that was really cool. And then the next year, Sting had his solo album. And... Uh, I just loved that free, free, set them free song. And I still do, and I know you don't. <laughs> but I don't know that I realized that it was the same guy that did Every Breath You Take and that. And yeah, it's funny because I remember from grade school, I was hanging, I was at my friend's house that I was good friends with. And he had a thing against Sting for some reason. I'm not sure why. Maybe because at the time, you know, Sting was everywhere and everything you know what i mean he was like the it boy or something for a, a few years where you know the police hit with synchronicity and every song was a huge hit and then he did his solo album and he was in dune and <laughs> et cetera et cetera he, he suddenly became everywhere and i think he was like just sick of this dude yeah his acting career is baffling isn't it yeah because i mean it's it, it was a short time, I guess, but it was just one of those where being a rock star wasn't enough. Or I, I don't remember him being bad as an actor. And yeah, I mean, he was just, he was one of the most memorable things about Dune, that metallic codpiece thing he wore or whatever. <laughs> but, I was going to mention that. But, <laughs> but anyway, continue. Your friend had but something But yeah, my friend about, had something against him. against him. And then I think it was 1986 when they came out with... I think it was 1986 and they came out with their greatest hits album and they had that reworked version of Don't Stand So Close to Me and they did a video for it and it was on MTV and uh, my friend sees it and he's like, oh, don't tell me that Sting. And his brother's like, it's the police. Of course it's Sting. What are you, an idiot or something? You know, it's basically his response. 
But yeah, you know, I don't know that I realized that Sting and the police were the same thing, you know, that they were the same guy. Like you were saying, you didn't know it was the same guy. That I don't know. I mean, I was I was probably a little more aware of pop culture well, things you than you MTV, were because yeah, I had that MTV would make it built in, but also I had several older brothers and sisters, and because of that, you know pop music and whatnot was playing in my household all the time, whereas you were the oldest. So until you brought it in, whatever your parents happened to be listening to was what was playing. So Hank Williams was the item of the day. So, yeah, I don't know. I had a a little bit more. I don't know. It was my older sister who uh, got the album Nothing Like the Sun. And I remember borrowing her Walkman when we were on a long trip on the summer or we driving across Nevada or something like that and uh, listening to that album and just absolutely loving it. And uh, a few years later, I uh, had a girlfriend who got the... She won a contest on the radio and won two free CDs is, was basically what she won. So it wasn't a big contest, but she went down to the radio station and picked two CDs out of their giveaway pile. And one of them was a squeeze CD and the other one was Sting the Soul Cages. And that's a great album. It's a really, really, it's one of his very best, I'd say. In my opinion, nothing like The Sun's number one and The Soul Cages is number two. And yeah, we listened, she started listening to that and liked it a lot to the point where she listened to it all the time. And so I heard it all the time. And, you know, the combination of those two experiences kind of made me into a Sting fan. And uh, when he finally came out with his next album, Pin Summoner's Tales, you know, I was basically there, you know, the first weekend, there, the first day that it came out to get it because I was now a fan and it was my thing was to like Sting, I guess. And so that's kind of where my affection came from. I never let you finish your... Yeah, I, I, I was aware of him, but I, I wasn't a fan, I don't think. And it, it's strange. It wasn't until he was on Saturday Night Live. And I, he was on Saturday Night Live a couple of years. One year, Steve Martin hosted the show and Sting was the musical guest. But Sting appeared in a sketch where Steve Martin was James Bond and Sting was the Bond villain. Uh-huh. Goad Sting. And... Uh, I just remember thinking that was really neat, and he sang uh, something off "Nothing Like the Sun." Probably uh, "We'll Be Together." Um, Usually, they got to sing two songs. They'd sing "We'll Be Together" and then one other deep album track. Yeah, it might have been um, like when he was on for every single. Oh, that's off the first album. I don't know when he was on for uh, Ten Summoners Tales." He did "If I Ever Lose My Faith in You," and then he did. Love is Stronger Than Justice, which I don't think he ever actually wow, that's put on the radio or anything kind of like that. obscure. But, he, but he anyhow... Performed. He Sting. put on a cowboy hat and the whole bit. Oh, that's cool. They, in between those, though, they had Sting back as the host. In 1991, right when Soul Cages was coming out, he was the host of the show. And that was when I was most in, into Saturday Night Live. And it was a classic episode. And it was the one that had the Sinatra group where Phil Hartman was Frank Sinatra doing a, a talk show and Sting played Billy Idol and Chris Rock played Luther Campbell and Jan Hooks played Sinead O'Connor and uh, is the one where uh, Billy, Billy Idol says, I'll cut you, old man. And Sinatra goes, I ain't afraid of you. I got chunks of guys tougher than you in my stool. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Sting played Dr. Frankenstein in this sketch and Phil Hartman was the Frankenstein monster. And for some reason, it was the funniest thing in the world because Sting was trying to teach the Frankenstein monster to be eloquent and speak in a uh, like a My Fair Lady sort of way. And he said, the big bully brandished the baseball bat and bashed the baby bunny. And Frankenstein's monster goes, <laughs> I don't, for some reason, it was so funny. He, he was having him repeat the things, like the rain in Spain falls mainly on the plane. And then he has him say this thing, and, he, and instead the monster goes, ah! 
Anyway, I don't know why, but that just was such an awesome, that was this, awesome that was episode. The same episode where the, he gets caught in the, the elevator with him. And they're like, oh, you're Sting, aren't you? Right. And, and they're like, yes, yes. And they're like, oh, yeah, you were the... You were the guy, oh, you did that. Roxanne! They all keep going, Roxanne! He's like, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, was, that was me, yeah. Every <laughs> single sketch in that episode was awesome. And they had the, the very first time Rob Schneider was the copy machine guy, mm-hmm. was, was in that episode. And, and then uh, there was this sketch way at the end of the show where Sting was this aspiring poet. And there's like all these guys at a poet, uh, as a, at a cafe or you know where they uh-huh. get up and they, they have an open mic kind of thing and they're all like really trite like you know like victoria jackson gets up there and says my man is handsome and the sun comes up when he smiles and then she sits down or whatever and sting gets up there and he's wearing like a black turtleneck and he starts talking about growing up in a bleak industrial town with like the most depressing, miserable lyrics. And I, I always wondered if he had actually written this. It was like a <laughs> failed Sting song because it belonged on Soul Cages. Yeah, it was just like it's... the black lung of the parents coming home, you know, kissing their babies and leaving, you know, a, a charcoal mark on the baby's forehead and stuff. And yeah, everybody just like gets up and leaves or everybody's disgusted by this this poem. I don't know. I, it's, it's it's weird that I remember that so much. Anyway, that made me a fan. And he played all this time. And I, that may have been the first time I ever heard that song. And I just was like, oh my gosh, this is... There, it, I recognized it as being deeper somehow, which makes mm-hmm. me sound p- really pretentious. But I don't know. There, there, There's something that you could interpret as pretentious about Sting's music. Where it's, you know, it's like he's trying to do more than just entertain or, or make a pop song. I mean, ultimately, that's his undoing, is Sting's lofty aspirations for all of his music. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I, so I went out and I bought the cassette of The Soul Cages. Then uh, for my birthday, I got a CD player, and the very first CD I got was the All This Time single. Wow. And so, and yeah, but I listened. There's an instrumental track on there called I Miss You, Kate that I listened to more than any other song I've ever heard in my life. We're probably in the multiple hundreds of times I listened. I would just put on I Miss You, Kate, repeat, and it would play from the whole moment I got home from school to, like, I left for school the next morning, it would still be playing. Yeah, that's a really good song. I like that one a lot. Uh, I, unfortunately, I didn't get it all the way back then. Um, I didn't. I never considered buying singles... Especially not see. I think it wasn't until I was in college when I bought my first CD single. I did have a couple of singles otherwise, but I didn't get them. I think the B sides. Well, the point of the didn't... single was just you don't want the album. You only want this one song. Right, but, but there some... were some bands like Sting that it's like, hey, we're going to reward you for buying the single. Yeah, here's a song you a... can't get anywhere else. Yeah, I started doing that first with Metallica because Metallica would do the same thing. They'd have songs. You know, they they do a cover of somebody else's song, and you would get that on uh, their CD or CD. It wasn't a CD. I got tape singles first. <laughs> I had the tape singles of several Metallica songs, and then uh, yeah, with Sting, I finally started thinking, man, I gotta you know, and I would start looking in the singles rack for Sting stuff. And when Mercury Falling came out, is when I started collecting his singles, and that was. The, a good time to start because I don't know that he really went off as well or did as much before that. I mean, I miss you. Kate was really good. Yeah, the B side on mad about you was that li- that tempted cover, which I'm sure you've heard the squeeze. Mm-hmm. Cause you mentioned she, the other CD she got was squeeze. Uh, you've heard him do tempted, right? Yeah, I think so. And that was on there. So that was really cool. But, uh, and on why should I cry for you? There was like this nine minute extended Why Should I Cry For You that was so beautiful. And then there was an, an alternate version of We'll Be Together, which you don't like anyway. So I don't know that you would have dug that. But Yeah, I'm, I'm much more of a fan of getting an actual new song, new song or a song that you haven't at least heard Sting do before, a, a cover of someone else's song. And especially I like it if, I mean, like Metallica would do covers and there were songs that I didn't know beforehand 
it's a song by a band called like Budgie or something like that, you know, where you just never heard, even heard of the band, much less heard of the song. And so that was always really cool because it would be like being introduced to a new song. Budgie. Like Tempted, you know, I mean, everybody's heard that song <laughs> otherwise, so it wouldn't be such a, a big thing to hear Sting sing it. You'd be like, oh, yes, yeah, that's all right, but you know, Squeeze actually does better. <laughs> I don't know, but yeah, I started collecting his singles in, when Mercury Falling came out, and yeah, it was really good, because he had a lot, a lot of really good... Basically, he could have had a double-sized album and just added all those songs on, because they were all great songs. And he never really did as good with the singles after that, either. No, at one point, they started to put out just three versions of that song yeah you can hear somebody's mix of this you can hear a techno beat mix of of a, uh, and yeah i guess that's what singles used to be right when there were records you know you'd want to get the single for the dj to play at a you know at a club or something like that but it just i i was always disappointed when you'd get a, a single and you'd look and that's it it really it literally was a single yeah, right <laughs> Yeah, I wanted some kind of a good B-side, and I think the last good single that he had was, uh, it was for Brand New Day, where he had uh, The End of the Game on, and wasn't there Wind one other? Windmills of Your Mind. Windmills of Your Mind, that's it. That was another one that was just great, a really good song. The two of them were really good, and I don't think he had another good, like I got the single for Desert Rose, but I think it had a remix of Desert Rose on it. <laughs> So, yeah. yeah was... I don't think I there were ever any that were worth getting. I got the single for Send Your Love. And if we ever publish this episode, I'll edit that line out. Because Send Your Love is the worst song. And all it has is Send Your Love and remix of Send Your Love. Ugh. They had the remix of Send Your Love on the album. I know, but it was pr before the it album a... came out. And so it's just like, oh, okay. Wow, new Sting single. <sighs> <laughs> but yeah, that's that's kind of the sad thing. And I guess every band is that way, or every artist or whatever. They have like their golden period. And maybe not every, I guess there's lots of artists that never have a golden period. Some of them have one song. Some of them don't even get that. But uh, with big name artists, you know, there's they have a golden period and they kind of fade away. Yeah, unfortunately, Sting couldn't last forever, and he's gotten to, you know, his last album was uh, Sacred Love, which came out in, I'd say 2004. I was going to say 2003, so let's see who's right. His last album was Sacred Love, which, well, his last pop, his last studio pop album <laughs> was Sacred Love, which came out in 2003, and that album is terrible. Terrible. Yeah, it's his worst. Well, I can't say it's his worst album because he has had just unlistenable crap albums. But of of songs he wrote himself with the intention of selling them. Yeah, this is his worst album. Yeah, it's not. I mean, he's had he he did a double live album called Bring on the Night, which was t just terrible. It was like take all the the worst songs that he's written and do live versions of them. You know, you had When the World is Running Down, you make the best of what's still around on there. You had Bring on the Night on there. But the weird thing is, that was after Dream of the Blue Turtles, but before Nothing Like the Sun. He had only had one solo right. album, and he did a double live album. <laughs> and it was, yeah, I mean, that's one that's not good. But it was a live album, and so as far as I'm concerned, count. it doesn't count. I don't, I don't even consider it. But he's done other stuff. Yeah, like, since then, he did a winter album this is what something that's come out since uh, sacred love a winter album he called it he didn't deign to call it a christmas album it's a winter album well i think there's like two christmas songs on there but you'd never know they were christmas songs unless yeah. you really really stretched your yeah you have to your... really be into really old 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 school christmas because that's the kind of songs that he used were like the ones that were written in 1417 by St. Francis of Assisi. And now you, you don't hate the Winter album? I don't hate it, but I don't like it. Okay, I hate it. But, there's but one even song. Or, oh. There's one song on the Winter album that I actually like that sounds like Sting. 
but it's not a soul cake, a soul no, cake. A Please soul tell Mister a soul cake. <laughs> but other than that, yeah, there's mostly it's Sting, and that's a, a funny thing about Sting is like when he was young, he had a really really high voice. He'd hit those high notes that most people can't hit. And uh, as he's gotten older and older, his ability to hit those notes, I think, has deteriorated to the point where now he doesn't try it very much at all. And his whole freaking winter album was him doing this breathy, low voice that he does all the time now. And I can't stand that. It's awful. But yeah, he did that album. And he also, I think before the winter album came out, he did Songs from the Labyrinth, which was an album of it was some composer who did songs of before the baroque period it's what you would call madrigal songs i believe this guy wrote these songs before 1600 and now, yeah. for what instrument sir uh, he learned the lute especially for this which was actually kind of cool because you got the lute version of there was actually a good song on songs of the well, songs of the labyrinth it wasn't on songs of the labyrinth it oh. was i think it may have been a b-side though on something but it was him doing uh, Fields of Gold on the lute, which was kind of interesting. Not, like, great or anything, but... But, yeah, so he did that, and it was, was not even released on A&M. It was released on, like, Varese Saraband Records or whatever it is that releases the classical albums. And, uh, yeah, he's done a album of his songs made into classical songs that was called symphonicities and we haven't had anything that could be considered a sting song he had an uh, i don't even know it was an acoustic there was a, all this time was just a live oh right yeah it was a live concert i mean it, it was really really low key and i don't know if it was intended to be but it was recorded on september 11th 2001 <laughs> and all these people had come out to Tuscana or where where was it? It was yeah, Tuscany. I think it was Tuscany. And he's like, "Well, should we cancel this concert?" And he's like, "Well, all these people came out. We'll do this, and maybe we'll eliminate a couple of the super happy songs." And it's so dreary. I mean, I like it because it's dreary, and that's something that I respond to about a lot of Sting's songs. But yeah, it didn't sell well, and of course, it wasn't going to. It just a lot of what people imagine Sting is, is is that. Essentially, it was the guy who sits down in the coffee shop and sings <laughs> about a cold right. northern industrial town. He sings about uh, many miles away in a dark Scottish lock, something crawling through the slime. Uh, like I said earlier, that ambition of Sting, is it an ambition? It's, it's his lofty self image or his 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 reach has really hurt him as a as an artist well maybe not as an artist but as a, a as a selling yeah as, as a commodity as a commercial artist and i get the impression i mean i don't know the man but i've listened to so many interviews and read so much stuff with him that i feel like i do he just gets so bored i mean even when he was a young young man he'd say a man falls in love with a woman, and the woman falls in love with the man. How boring can you get? I want to turn it on its side. I want, I want there to be something else that's... Maybe the man falls in love with a woman, but the woman is in love with another man. And it's the enemy of this man. Maybe, maybe that you could write a song about. And it's just like, he didn't want to just write a song that people would dance to, or people would fall in love to, or any of that stuff. His greatest inspiration would be when someone close to him died and then suddenly he'd write madly about his mother dying for nothing like the sun or his father dying for the soul cages and he'd just have these awesome awesome songs and then nothing for a long time and yeah you know and he's he writes a lot of songs that are that way turned on their head you know you, the song that so many people are like oh yeah this is our song you know every breath you take people play that song and dance to it together at their wedding or something like that and Sting finds out about this and he's like really? Did you listen to the words of the song? It's about this creepy stalker guy that's 
following this girl around. I mean, you realize this, right? Has there ever been a person that discovered that and decided they no longer liked the song? I because it. I'm a creepy stalker guy, maybe it just speaks to me. Because that is one <laughs> of my most beloved songs. Oh, yeah, everything Sting song. has ever written, that's it. That's the cat's pajamas. And I wonder, you know, if I were a normie, if I'd be like, ew, there's a dude that watches a girl. That's gross. You know, I, I don't know. I don't know. I think most people, if they, they're told that it, they should be creeped out by it, they're just like, yeah, whatever. I like it. I like what I like. So they're... But um, like on Brand New Day, there's an, a song written from the perspective of a dog that's in love with his owner. And she's always going to see him as a dog. And there's a song, I mean, even more bizarrely, written from the point of view of a... He's a man who dresses as a woman to have sex with other men who aren't comfortable with having sex with a man. But if the man is dressed as... Anyway, I, it's just like the typical romance song or the typical pop song or whatever isn't enough. For Sting. And early, early on, it, well, that was the case. When suddenly he's like, well, I'm going to have Spanish in this song. Or I'm going to take a Prokofiev. What's his name? The, the guy that did... Prokofiev. I'm going to do... I'm going to take this classical number and see if I can make a pop song out of it or a rock song out of it. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Speaking of your wacky stuff, I think Stolen Car, Take Me Dancing, maybe one of the best examples. It's about a car thief who steals a car and then imagines the life of the person that has the car that he's stolen. He imagines that the guy is probably not showing enough attention to his wife and his wife wants him to take her dancing on a date. She, she said that, that he would take her and it's like, how does that turn into a song? Where the, the car thief imagines the life of the person he's stealing the car from and it's this take me dancing you don't pay enough attention to me. So, I don't know. See, in the in the 80s, at some point, Sting decided, I'm not going to do pop songs anymore. I'm going to do jazz. Right. You know what I mean? And then in the early 90s, he thought, I'm going to try country music. And he did like four or five just unbelievably good country songs. Yeah. And that, But by the time it was the 21st century, yeah, he, he became obsessed with shit like the lute. Because I, I now my guess is, and I don't really know Sting, so I don't know. But my guess is this guy is so unbelievably talented that he gets bored so easily at, at anything, and so it's just like, okay, I'm going to write a song, and I'm going to write it on the piano, and I'm going to teach myself to play the piano, and I'm going to play the piano in the song. I was like, well, that's too easy. Well, I'm going to find a dead instrument that nobody <laughs> knows how to play. Kind of thing, and then yeah, he he's like, oh, I'm gonna you find. Mean he didn't care. Mazov didn't know how to play the lute, <laughs> and uh, oh, a desert rose where it's just like, I'm gonna take. I'm assuming it's Arabic. What is Cheb Mami singing in in that song? I'm not sure. I don't know, but I would have guessed Hindi or something like that. Would oh, is that right? I'm sorry. Thing. Okay, I blew it. But it felt feels so Middle Eastern. Desert rose. To yeah. Me. See, to me, it seems Indian. So I don't know what the huge difference is. I'm not knowledgeable enough to be able to go in there and pick one out and say, this is this and this is that. And so, see, something that Sting... Seagull! Something that Sting <laughs> loved to do early, early on was he would take a, a song with the, probably when he was still with the police and he says, we're going to switch it up. We're going to make that, that fast police song into a slow ballad or whatever. And I, I know that it drove Andy and Stuart nuts. Because a lot of people that go to concerts or whatever, they want to hear the song exactly the way it was played on an album. Right. Which I can understand, but at the same time, I, I can appreciate it when somebody plays something and I'm just like, wow, who would have known that yeah. you could play that three times faster and it made it like almost a metal song? Wow. I know that my friend was really upset when uh, we were in high school and we got the, uh, the singles greatest hits album that they had of the police and... They didn't have the regular Don't Stand So Close to Me on it. They only had the slow version of it. And he's just like, oh, but I love that, you know, to jump around and go crazy that Don't Stand So Close and this doesn't have it. Yeah, see, that was probably a mistake to release it without both. But I love the 86 version mm -hmm. way more than the oh, other yeah? one. 
And initially that was Sting's idea because the police were already broken up. They broke up in 84 after Synchronicity came out. But the, the record label oh, the record wanted label. to do a greatest hits. And yeah, Sting got it into his head that they would get the band together and he would write all new arrangements to their hit songs and the band would play them and the, and it would be like a new album. It would be more than just a greatest hits. It would People would buy way more copies of it because it would be all different versions. And they recorded two songs. I, I, I'm thinking that the other one was... Uh, do you remember what the other one was? I don't remember. Because I have it, but it, it didn't make the album. But they hated each other so much by this yeah, point. Yeah, they just couldn't get along that enough finally, to do that. That finally, whoever the producer was... Um, at that point, just had them all record their parts separately. And he says, okay, you know, Andy, you, you can come in for an hour and do this. And then Stuart's going to come in. He's going to do the drums and, and all that. And yeah, they weren't even in the same room for that recording because they hated each other so much. And yeah, after the failed attempt on these two songs, that's all that they put out. And, you know, for a long time, it was, I resented the other two band members because, you know, Sting was obviously the talent in that band but now that i'm a little older i can see how frustrating that would be and how much of the spotlight he did hog mm -hmm. i mean you look at the police the body of work of the police and every single great song was written by sting right and when maybe there's a good song written by andy maybe there's a good song written by by stewart but like all of their hit songs were written by sting right and he did have, I don't want to say a flamboyant personality, but he did have one of those really look at me kind of personalities. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, it was that time, like I was talking about where Sting was everywhere to the point that my friend was, oh no, is that Sting? Because ah! every time you couldn't swing a dead cat around in the world at that time without hitting something that had to do with Sting. And yeah, if you were part of his band... And he doesn't want to play the same songs that made you famous. He wants to he wants to act, and he wants to do solo things with Eberhard Schroner, and you know appear on other people's Dire Straits albums. Yeah, or Phil Collins and things like that, and Duran Duran. I can see them just being like, "Oh, dude, please, you know, it's just, just toe the line, you know, be a band instead of Sting and the Police," which uh, later on that's what they became known as which has to suck. I mean, you, the band's been broken up for a decade and suddenly they start calling him Sting and the police. Ugh. But it, it is a shame. The guy can't just write something simple. or I mean, I, I, everything has to be new. And, and to have that level of perfectionism or whatever the deal is, is admirable. But it, I think it's really made us miss out on a lot of music that we yeah, would have otherwise it kind loved. of kind of seems like a waste of a great talent he's got a really good talent for making songs that people will enjoy like you said i mean every hit police song was written by him all of those songs were his and he had several other really great songs since becoming a solo artist that are that way but it wasn't interesting enough to him and so he's moved on to the loot or whatever and yeah, I mean, the world's missing out on those kind of things that they they could have had, but he he needed to have an experience <laughs> like Wreck-It Ralph had, where he learned to understand what his strengths were, understand who he was, and love who he was, so that he could just continue to give us good song after good song after good song. Well, you know, we, we talk about writing all the time, and we've talked about Dean Koontz a lot of times. And sometimes I, I become really paranoid with my writing when I've written a story and I'll think, you know, in 1992, I wrote a story kind of like this and nobody's ever read that story and nobody's ever read this story. <laughs> but someday someone may discover that in the 21 years between now and then, I wrote two stories that were very similar. And what will they think? And I'm all paranoid about that. And yet there are people like Dean Koontz who continue to write novel after novel, which is identical to another novel that they wrote. I mean, you know, just again and again and again. And as far as I know, I'm the only person bothered by that. You know, I, I imagine each one of his books still sells a million copies, right? I don't know. I and, don't know what his level is now. There was a time, at least in the 90s, where he was bestseller list every single time. I don't know if that's changed. Uh, you know, maybe I shouldn't use this as an example, but somebody like Dave Matthews or whatever, 
all of their songs are the same. <laughs> you know, he put out this fantastic song, Crash, into me. And then there's like 10 songs that are Crash into me, part due. And people scoop them up and people love them. And people have tons of favorite Dave Matthews Band songs. And maybe that's a bad example, but which is better? If, if you love Dave Matthews, you're probably ecstatic that he's written another 10 songs and not let a decade go by in between albums. Or when he does <laughs> put out an album, you wish that he hadn't because of what it is. Uh-huh. I don't know. Sting still tours a lot and he's still touring on the same songs, although they do sound different every five years or whatever. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. It is fun to hear what he's done with Roxanne this time or taken a, a song that used to be hard rock and now it's got bongos and a ukulele in it. <laughs> <laughs> Ukuleles are hip right now. Even the Dune Steve Diddy was played on a ukulele. Okay, well, that would make anything hip. <laughs> she, she could have done Dune Steve Diddy on a kazoo and people were like, wow. Yeah, they were talking about that. There was... Michael Buble's got a kazoo album coming out. Yeah, I was thinking about that the other day. They were, they were mentioning something where there was supposedly a preschool marching band. <laughs> But all they really were was just kids walking along while a song played. And they're like, oh, they don't play anything? They don't even play kazoos? And I just thought, dude, that would be so awesome. Like a bunch of four-year-olds playing some song together on a kazoo in a marching band, like in a parade. That would be cool. I would watch that. Well, well give me your feelings on the man, because I've, I've talked and talked and talked. And I, I hope I'm not too hard on, on him, because I still, I love Sting more than any other artist. And... His songs that are telling a story or whatever are are just amazing to me. And I wish that he would do that more because that's stretching your creativity. Like, I, I know you don't like After the Rain Has Fallen, but that tells a story. And the Island, of, the Island of Souls tells a story. And, right. uh, Soul Cages tells a, a story. I still want to make a movie out of Soul Cages. I <laughs> love that story. And I, I don't really know why that wasn't enough. It's like, okay, we'll tell another story. Now it has to be something obscure and dead sounding <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I i don't hate after the rain has fallen it's not one of my favorites but i do like the story of it and a lot of other songs i was actually thinking that with several of the songs because in the in the last like the reason why i decided to do this episode at all is within the last week or so we were cleaning out our garage and i found a bunch of cds that i had in bags because i don't nobody uses cds anymore really they're they're as dead as the loot. Um, and But I found these. I have a CD player in my car, which I sometimes use, but only rarely. So I thought, why don't I take all these CDs and put them in my car and listen to them? So I took these three bags full of CDs, put them in my car, and started pulling out whatever came up next. And one of the bags was basically full of all of my Sting CDs, because they were some of the ones that I held on to. I actually, you know, Sting was that artist that even though I was done buying CDs, I would still buy his CD when it came out. I bought songs from the Labyrinth on CD. I think I was with you when you I bought it. I think that was the last one that I did finally buy on CD, though. And then the same thing, Metallica was the one other uh, artist that I would do that with where I bought their CDs. I think I bought all the way up to their... Well, okay. They finally did... Caused me to not buy when they did that freaking album with Lou Reed. I was like, oh, you finally found something to make me not buy your CD. Good job, guys. You win. You've been trying for years to chase me away, and now you win. Yeah, Sting has kind of done the same thing. But anyways. But Sting has stopped too, right? Or, or did Metallica stop putting Metallica's out albums? Metallica's put out albums. After the Black album, you basically would only get an album every four years. So they're pretty much about the same release schedule as Sting. Really, really seldom. But one, sorry, I, I do want to hear what you think. But the man could put out two or three albums filled with his B-sides and soundtrack songs and obscurities. And they would have sold way more than the loot shit. Do you know what I mean? Because <laughs> people would be like, wow, ooh, these are new Sting songs. And they're, they're not new, but they're really, really good. Right, And I, I have no idea whoever makes these decisions at A&M, why they didn't just release compilations of obscurities. I, I don't get it. Yeah, they definitely should have. There's a lot of really good songs that 
I had no idea existed. And they were like, wow, did you know that Sting has a song on the Racing Stripes soundtrack? You know that song where the zebra what's the, wait, becomes what's a the race name of the song? And, and the freaking uh, the fly, it's taking the inside rail, I inside believe. Ra- That's a good it's song. An awesome song. It's really good. One of his best ones from post-2000. One of his best songs that he did after Brand New Day, I would say. I don't know what else could compare to it, to tell you the truth. Well, I loved Until, which was oh, from right, right. That Kate was, and Leopold. Was that after... Wasn't that still in the 90s when that Kate and Leopold came out? No, that was the one where he was depressed after the Tuscany concert because oh. of September 11th. And he looked and somebody had sent him a screener of Kate and Leopold and said... You know, we'd like you to do a song for this movie. And he watched it and it, it cheered him up. And he's like, oh, I, I'm going to do that. Oh, okay. I was thinking for some reason that that movie came out like 99 or something like that. But, um, but I, th- yeah, another thing to talk about, although we can't, is uh, Kingdom of the Sun. <laughs> and see, that's something. Let's say we're in an alternate universe where Kingdom of the Sun actually came out. Maybe in that way he would have fulfilled a little bit of his ambition yeah. and said, oh, I want to do a bunch of that. I, I'm going to write my own animated film and do the music, <laughs> which yeah. would have been a hundred times better than Songs of the Labyrinth. You know, like, Right. Even in this non-alternate universe, if they were just to take those songs and release them for us to hear, I would buy them. Um, but anyways, yeah, going back to the story, yeah, I, the reason we did this album is because I took all those CDs... I threw them in the car, pulling out album after album, and I was putting them in, and a lot of them were my wife's CDs, so I wouldn't even have to put them in before I knew I want to listen to Ace of Bass. But uh, other ones I'd pull out, and I'd be like, oh, yeah, I haven't heard this in a long time, and I'd put it in, and I'd be like, oh, yeah, that's why I haven't heard it in a long time, and I'd take it back out. And then I started coming across the whole bag that was full of Sting CDs, and so I've listened to Sting's entire studio album catalog in the last week and uh, yeah I was asking Rich to go through his CDs and, and give his his songs a rating a star rating between one and five for the heck of it just to see what ones he really likes and I was thinking one thing that'd be really cool to talk about before we finish up is just you were saying there were some songs that you would give five stars to that would be your absolute favorites and I thought it'd be interesting to hear what some of those songs are and then i could talk about some of my songs that i would give five stars to and then i guess we can say goodbye well there's two kinds of song that i love one is a song that came out at a specific point in my life and it reminds me of that Mm -hmm. and i I love it for nostalgic purposes and then there there are the other category are there are timeless songs you know i've always loved i can't even say why but uh, but i don't get sick of them kind of thing and <laughs> he did a song for Kingdom of the Sun, or I, I don't know if it even was for Kingdom of the Sun, when Kingdom of the Sun was a Disney animated film that got canceled after he had written these songs for it. And they salvaged it by using the backgrounds and a couple of the characters, I think, and turning it into The Emperor's New Groove. But I believe Sting had written a song for it or wrote a song later called My Funny Friend and Me, which I adore that song, yeah. man. And yeah, that's one of the five star ones. I mean, it's not an album track, but I love that song. And that's probably the the newest song by Sting that I absolutely love. If, if you can name one that came later, maybe I'll have to amend that. When did Emperor's New Groove come out? 2000. It was like the year after uh, Brand New Day. Okay. Didn't Brand New Day come out in 2000 as well? No. It was 99? Yeah. Um, yeah, something that came out since then. That's hard. Until is a really good song. And I really like that Taking the Inside Rail song as well. One Day She'll Love Me. Or He'll Love Which How did that song go? That was the other One song from the... I remember playing that for my sister. Me. I've got several sisters that I've made into sting addicts and i remember playing that song for and she's just like yeah now wait it's a weird song because it has nothing to do with the movie whatsoever it's like they're singing about that's a a a cast off from kingdom yeah it's gotta be a kingdom of the sun song where there was still some sort of a love interest and whatever was going on in that story i have no idea even what it was and that and that was him and sean colvin yeah 
That's a good song. Yeah. It is good. I, but again, his lofty aspiration, you can really feel the ambition in that song. And he's like, you know, because he's thinking Elton and Phil Collins got Oscars for their, their <laughs> yeah, Disney songs. Go. I'm, gonna, I'm going to do something bigger than them. <laughs> Didn't work out. Instead, they killed it. I don't know that I can think of something from recently that uh, I would give a five star to for sure. I think the last song that I would give a five star to that he did probably fill her up. I love that song. I do too. And, and again, at this point, Lofty he was bored even with country music. And, and so he says, well, I'm going to do country and then have it become gospel and then have it become rock or, or, it or maybe the opposite. It more like a jazz jam <laughs> at the end. It goes from gospel into like a, a kind of a jam session with the, who, the, the musicians. But yeah, I love that three-part effect to it. You know, you have the song, you, the setup of it, then, you know, the payoff and then just, yeah. The... But see, that's not going to play on the radio. You know no. what I mean? And, and maybe he prides himself in that, but... That's not going to sell iTunes downloads or whatever. I suppose not. He's a rich man, though. I bet he's probably he not is. in big need of that. And yeah, that's the thing that we you we want. I was complaining about Robert Downey Jr. not wanting to be Iron Man anymore. But when you have that much money, I guess you can say. I mean, anybody talks about if I ever won the lottery, the first thing they do is quit their job. Right. I mean, even before like leave their wife, it's always quit <laughs> quit my job. <laughs> If you leave your wife, then you've also left half of that money you just won in the lottery. I mean, come on. But yeah, that's probably the most recent five-star song. Some of my other... I, I mean, I, t I've, I mentioned to Rish, and he disputes my feelings, but I think Nothing Like the Sun is his best album. And on that album, you've got Englishman in New York, which I think is a five-star song of Sting's. I absolutely love it. It's just awesome. They Dance Alone, another five-star song which te is one of those that tells a story of something that was happening and this was actually you know what was going on where was pinochet chile. was that chile okay so in chile yeah this stuff was going on where people were disappearing and as protest they would do this dance which is the cueca or something like cueca that? solo which would just be the women would dance by themselves, as though they were dancing with someone. They're dancing with their invisible son, husband, you know, father, whoever it is that has disappeared, and it was their protest. I think Sister Moon I might even give a, a, a five-star rating to on there as well. There's a lot of really good songs on that album. Moon Over Bourbon Street. See, I wish that I had known Moon Over Bourbon Street when I was a kid. Did that ever play on the radio, do you think? I don't think so. I mean, well, there's no way of knowing... But had I known what that song was about, I would have gotten into Sting so much earlier. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, it was the title, Murder by Numbers, that made me stand up and take notice of this album. And, and if I had you know, known what that was about, that's one of his very first story songs, too. And I just, oh, I love Moon Over Bourbon Street, man. I'm so happy I can't stop crying. Definitely five star. Yeah, you and I actually sang that together once, right? Oh, yeah, we did. Yeah, on karaoke night when it was... Pony Express Days. We went out to Pony <laughs> Express Days karaoke. And I was... Met a friend of mine. He said, You look different somehow. And I was the guy that said, You look different somehow. And I think I had it. I hear she more. had another man. Yeah. I wondered how you felt about it. Uh, I got to say Which those. is the most insensitive line. Something that somebody could say. It's like, hey, I hear your uh, wife has been screwing the milkman. I wonder how you felt about that. I was just that. wondering how that made you feel. Good or <laughs> how does that make you feel? Why Should I Cry For You is another five-star song. Oh, I love that song. Yeah, I was super into a girl in 91, in the year that that, song, that album came out. And she liked Sting. And I think she liked Sting before that CD came out. But I felt like we had that in common and... Those songs reminded me of her and uh, the loneliness, the the despair in Soul Cages. I mean, every song except for the Soul Cages, there there is some kind of sadness or there's some kind of loss or there's some kind of longing for the, the sea or the ocean or whatever. Or may, may, is it Mad About You? What Even Mad About You, there are no victories throughout our histories without love. You know, you can, there's some kind of... Yeah, it's, it's a longing, he can't definitely. Be, yeah. He'd give up all his kingdoms for a 
course. Wait, no, that's something else. <laughs> but yeah, and of course, Fields of Gold, I would say, is a five star, as well as in this album, Seven Days. Now, your ringtone when your wife calls is dance. When we dance. When we dance. And you didn't mention that one. Uh, that was a greatest hits uh, Right, but that you didn't mention that song. song. So I didn't mention it. I guess because I don't have the greatest hits album here in front of me. I didn't listen to that one within the last week. I only listened to the studio albums, not the compilations. But yeah, I love that song a lot. I remember it came out and I I was out of the country when the greatest hits album came out. So I didn't get to know it until after I came back to the United States and was reintroduced to the world. That one, and there's a... a an edit of it that's I think called the radio edit or something like that. A fields of go- of of when, when we, we dance, which I think I got off of you when uh, I discovered just how many B sides you had <laughs> at your house. I came over and borrowed all your CDs from you and copied them off. But yeah, I actually used that song. I made a wedding video back when we got when me and my wife got married, and I used that as one of the songs in the video. And uh, I don't know that my wife thinks of it as our song, but I kind of think of it as our song. Well, what terrible song did she intend or did she insist you use on the wedding? Video? She didn't insist. I made it all on my own, all of my own devices. I used Every Little Kiss from Bruce Hornsby and the Range, um, which is another one that I kind of think of as our song. Especially because it talks about her being a thousand miles away and at the time... <laughs> That's about how far apart we were because she was up in uh, Edmonton in Canada and I was all the way down here. And uh, so it would take me 18 hours to drive to see her. So uh, we didn't do it all that often, unfortunately. We were glad to get married because then we could actually see each other. (laughs) As far as I know, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the only cover that Sting has on any of his albums is Little Wing by Jimi Hendrix. And that is one of my five-star favorite Sting songs. I do not like that. Can you think of another cover that's on there? On any of his albums? I can't think of one off the top of my head. Well, I'm going to say that that, that that's it. But yeah, Um, I I do like that one an awful lot too. And I've heard, one time just for fun, I went on YouTube and just typed in Little Wing cover. And so many bands have done covers of that. And I just listened to their versions and all that. And yeah, I guess because Sting's was my introduction to that, that is my favorite version of that song. But Yeah, that's uh, there's usually the a, way that goes. Th- there's, there's something about that. And yeah, maybe maybe we're t- you're talking about your wife and I'm talking about my shattered life. <laughs> uh, but just the the idea of a girl who would say that in, in Little Wing is so uh, fantastic. Uh, you know, just a... Uh, you know, we, we always say that. we you always talk about you, you just made that story say. up. There ain't no girl like <laughs> that, and in my experience, there ain't no girl like that. Uh-huh. But it it, it 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 may be, and we don't know what Jimi Hendrix intended when he wrote that. But it may be that Sting is singing about a girl wishing she would say these things, but she won't. You know, it's his own fantasy that she says. It's all right. It's all right, she says. <laughs> anyway, who cares? I, that is one of my favorites. Go ahead. You. you. Oh, I was just going to ask you what you said a girl that would say that. And you did. Yeah. I was going to say for our listener, well, clear see, up for them what that like is said, in case they don't know the song. I get uncomfortable with these intimate details. Oh, I don't think we have. Do we have lyrics in this? I can pull out the. Uh... Yeah, there are lyrics in that one. I know he does the that's one that's the one thing I, I didn't mention this I don't think on the episode but right before we started I was talking about how one of the things I love about nothing about the or sorry nothing like the sun is he talks about each song he kind of describes it or whatever and uh, gives you a little background behind the song which I think is super cool. It's unfortunate he doesn't do that with all of his albums because every one of these songs means a little more to me because I know that much about the background of it. And sometimes finding out what inspired a song or what a song is actually about 
and, and when he's in concert, often he will explain a song before he plays it. Like end of the game is about two foxes that are being hunted and they know they're going to die. I, I, I don't know. There's something just, again, so melancholy and romantic about that. Wow. I, uh, and oh, you know, end of the game is a five star song. I, I I love that song so much, man. Oh, speaking of five star songs, twenty five to midnight, dude. You know, I was listening to that. I was thinking, gosh, that would be wait, awesome. Wait, what did they call themselves? What was the name of the they band? Call, we called ourselves the, the Latino Latin. Lovers, Hawaiian shirts and, and top, top forty, 40 covers. covers. But yeah, I was just thinking as I was listening to that one, that would be a great like romantic comedy somehow. I'm not sure exactly how you could write it. But, you know, there's th- these two that are together, but the one guy wants to go off and be a rock star somehow. And, you know, you have the end where he's on the train. It's 25 to midnight. He has to be home by midnight or else she said, you know, no, that's it. I'll just go and marry Jack. And <laughs> You know, I'm, I, I'm not familiar enough with that song. Oh, it's, be- it's a great song. I, I, I remember it as a single. I mean, as a B-side. Uh, if you were in Great Britain or Japan or something, it was actually part of Mercury Falling, but wow. Yeah, the the other songs that were also on those singles, you know, 25 to Midnight, which is a really good song, but also Lullaby to an Anxious Child, I would give that a five star to. Pirate's Bride, I would give that a five star. Did Pirate's Bride show up somewhere else? I don't think so. Lullaby to an Anxious Child was on his winter uh, album he yeah, did a remake but it was version. a different version it was an inferior version yeah you know pirate's bride could have been a top 10 song somebody somewhere as soon as pirates of the caribbean hit big should have released that as yeah, a single i just oh that was such a good song and I, I i've never read an interview with him or whatever of where these other songs came from whether they just were dropped because he didn't, they didn't feel like they were good enough or commercial enough for the album, or if he wrote them later and it was in between, you know what I mean? But it's just like, who decides what's going to be a single, too? Right. And I, 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 I don't understand that, but whoever decides what Sting songs should be singles really should have lost their job a long time ago. Yeah. And now, I, you know, I, all this time, I'm glad because, you know, that made me the diehard Sting fan that I am today. But it doesn't seem like it would have been as commercially viable as other songs on that album. And then, yeah, to put Send Your Love as <laughs> as the single from that last album. There wasn't much else to choose from, though, unfortunately. His last album, there was a dearth. There was one song on the, maybe two songs that I would give 3-2, but probably would only just give a 2-2. Two, two, and the rest were all ones. So Send Your Love... It wasn't the worst song on there. I oh, it think. is. I'm sorry, sir. That's not my opinion. I can't agree with that. There's does oh, there's dozens. <laughs> there's a dozen songs on the album. There's but only almost, like five songs on the album. Almost all of them are terrible. Two of them are Send Your Love. A couple of them are tolerable and nothing is but good. But it seems like that duet with Mary J. Blige might have been... Might have been a bigger su- single, because I guess. A, you get her audience that might be interested in that. And, 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 and two, it at least sounds like a, a traditional love song or whatever. Uh, I'm not a fan of that song. Uh, okay. I don't like it at all, I have to say. And it's not, I, I don't know, I, I don't dislike Mary J. Blige. I, there are some songs that she does that I do like, but that one is not one of them. Mm. Oh, so it's the song. It's not Mary J. Blige. Right. Because, like, when he did it with the white chick and that last concert, it, you didn't like the song any better or le- worse. I don't even remember that. I'm did you sure go to I, the concert? No, I didn't go to the concert. The last time you saw him was with the police? Mm-hmm. And yeah, I haven't been to his shows very often. I, I went to the Mercury Falling tour with my girlfriend that year that it came around in Sacramento. And I don't think I've seen otherwise seen him except for the time that we went and saw the police i haven't been to that many concerts i guess when it comes down to it owing to the fact that they want a hundred dollars a show these days i mean do they well i don't know i guess it depends the last ticket i bought was that one that you and i went to in in denver yeah that one was 50 i think something and we were third 
I mean, we were, we're in the Jeep way seats. the heck up there. I suppose all this stuff gets edited out. It's just yeah, we're just blah, talking blah, at this now. point now. All right. Well, thanks for listening to this, folks. I don't know. Hopefully, you found something enjoying. Maybe you'd like to go out and try some of Sting's albums. Maybe you only know him by his police singles and his "Set Them Free" <laughs> and "We'll Be Together Tonight" singles. But do you continue to despise? I continue. Like- I despise them. I don't like those songs. They're not among his best. You know, we went through and named a bunch of five star songs off, and they didn't. They weren't even included in the list. So. If you don't know Sting very well, check him out. He's got a lot of really good stuff. It's, you know, a certain style. So if you're a death metal fan, you may not find something for you. But they're good songs. They're soulful songs. They're meaningful songs. They have a lot of emotion in them. And uh, they were enough to independently make Rish and I big fans of the guy without... I don't know, I still think that's weird <laughs> somehow. The fact that we're both huge fans of Sting, but it has no basis whatsoever to our friendship. I think it's kind of funny. Uh, but anyways, yeah, that's our evergreen <laughs> episode of That Gets My Goat. Hope that's you enjoyed right. it. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. And please join us next week when we'll talk about our love for Yanni. Hey, that ain't funny, man. That gets my goat is produced under a Creative Commons non-commercial 3.0 license. Big and Richard a national treasure, man. You know, he had that descriptions. That all Spanish those Portuguese album too right. in there. But it really shouldn't count. It's just like It doesn't. Yeah, it was it just was, him trying to stretch, I guess. I think it was it was actually he wasn't the only one. I think it was an A and M thing. They tried to get their most you know, their biggest artists to do because David Lee Roth did one that was called what did his his called because stings was called nada como el sol right which is just nothing like the sun in spanish david lee roth's was yeah i was watching a my name is earl <laughs> a few years ago back when that was still putting out new episodes they i think uh, catalina had gotten deported back to mexico or something and so earl and what was his brother's name ethan Supley played him i don't know yeah, I can't think of his name. But anyways, they went back because his brother was in love with Catalina. And How so, could you not? <laughs> and so they went down to Mexico to, to save her and to bring her back. And yeah, there was a part where craziness was going on. And then all of a sudden you hear David Leroy, La la mail do cabino do tobacco. And I was just like, oh my gosh, that's right. David Lee Roth did that album too. And his was, gosh, which one was it? Crazy from the Heat? It was one of those that he did several songs in Spanish. I'm reminded of that part in That Thing You Do, where Tom Hanks is reading off the things that they signed, that they you know committed to do in their contract. And like number three was, you will record a version of That Thing You Do in Spanish. <laughs> and they all just like, oh, no. You know, like this is the <laughs> lowest request imaginable. <laughs> Take two. I wish I had a chalupa, I'd eat one here with you. Everyone around me could have a bite or two. I love chalupas, do you love chalupas? Chalupas are good. I could have chalupas, I would want chalupas right here in the woods. We could have a chalupa party, everyone could come. You could come and you could come, but not Prince Cryden, because he is scum. I have on good authority, scum. I don't know how to end the song, but chalupa's fun.